In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as a father. For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. When does this passage stop being true of like the here and now? So John enters into his ministry declaring repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I guess a good question to start would be, is the kingdom of heaven still at hand? Um, second question is, what is repentance? Repentance, the word is metanoia, which means a change of mind. It's a, the sort of change of mind that affects every part of your daily life. Uh, it's it's the, the change of mind that makes you leave a career that, that hurts people, perhaps. Maybe you're in a certain ruthless trade or something, like a debt collector, um, and you decide that you've had enough and that you want to do what's right by people. It's that kind of change, the, the change of mind that leads to a change of action. And so John is a prophet. He's the last of the old covenant prophets. He prepares the way of the Lord. He makes straight the paths of Jesus. And as he's seeing the religious establishment come and check him out, um, he tells these people in no uncertain terms, um, you brood of vipers, you, you snakes. Even in our modern context, to call someone a snake is an incredible insult. Um, so I guess a, a better question is, is it true that they're snakes? John being a prophet, he doesn't speak for his own his own opinion. He speaks for God. And Jesus fully endorses John as something that is not just a prophet, but more than a prophet. And not just more than a prophet, but the greatest man born of woman to that point. So when John says, you brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? When he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, what does he mean? Well, if you've changed your mind about your sin before God and you've vowed to amend your ways, I guess the real question is, did you amend your ways? Did you indeed change your mind? If there's no change of behavior, the evidence for the change of mind that is repentance, metanoia, is very suspect. Further, let, let's let's drop out of the, the first century for a moment. Is this true for right now? Is John's word to the Pharisees of his day true of the Christian leaders of today? I highly encourage you, if you haven't seen it, just, just do a, a search for a couple of things. One, search for Hillsong on Google News and see some of the reports that have come out about Hillsong, which is uh, a very large uh, mega church with many sites throughout the world. There was, there's one in San Francisco, one in New York, 
the home church is in Sydney. And what you see about this church is that they've done a systematic cover-up of all kinds of sexual abuse, not to mention all the litany of issues with their theology and their music, lyrics. Um, and you also have to act, like just ask ask the question, what is it that is the cause of this? Is the cause that there is a severe lack of fruit demonstrating repentance? If there's a severe lack of fruit demonstrating genuine repentance, then we're in the same situation as Mr. John the Baptist. Another ministry I encourage you to look up is the Southern Baptist Convention. Look up the Guide Star Ministry Report on the Southern Baptist Convention's handling of abuse in its churches. For decades, they contained a list that was secret uh, of different pastors and ministry leaders in the Southern Baptist Convention who had accusations of abuse. And they really didn't do much to address those concerns of the victims of the abuse. Um, and so for decades, it just went untouched until they finally released this independent report of GuideStar. Um, so my question is this, these are elite people within evangelicalism. The lead pastor of Hillsong, Sydney, is a good friend of the Prime Minister of Australia, or maybe the former Prime Minister of Australia. Um, is John the Baptist not speaking to today? Is he not speaking to Hillsong? Is he not speaking to the Southern Baptist Convention? Or should we just do business as usual? The other thing that John the Baptist says in his message is every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So if these trees are to be cut down if they bear no good fruit and they're to be thrown into a fire, is that is that for the Southern Baptist Convention? Is that true of them? Is that is that true of Hillsong? Is that true of interchurch name here, there, wherever you are in the country and in the world? I believe the answer is yes. I've been accused of taking some Old Testament passages out of context. Uh, things like from Jeremiah and Isaiah. I've been told that I've taken those out of context, but I believe the appropriate context of those passages is a time of apostasy, a time of unfaithfulness in the halls of institutional Christianity, or in that context, Judaism. I believe the reason why we need to explore this is because this is true for every generation of the church. Every, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And not only is it cut down for a new generation to rise up in its place, but the church is to be cut down at the roots if it does not bear good fruit. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, to the disciples that were with him through his trials. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, what is it good for except to be thrown out and trampled on by people's feet? The last passage that really speaks to this issue is Jesus himself. I mean, it's one thing for John the Baptist to speak to the Pharisees and Sadducees and Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of his day, and pronounce Jeremiads of cursing and judgment on them. Very well, if, if we're to cut that off from our present moment, 
and say that it's not for now. Listen to what Jesus himself says. This cannot but be for now. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Who is the you? Obviously the direct context is the people that he was speaking to in that context. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. What's the implication of that? It's a direct command to abide in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So if we try to keep the husk of the Christian church going, we make it all about Sunday worship. If we make it all about meetings, uh, Bible studies. But, but without Jesus Christ, it's useless. We can talk the Bible all we want. We can meet up as many hours of the week as we want. But without him, it's useless. He says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Bringing it back to John the Baptist, what does it mean for Jesus' words to abide in us? It doesn't simply mean that we think about them a lot or listen to them in sermons. What it means is when God speaks through the Bible, we do what he says. We bear fruit in keeping with that word that he speaks to us. He says, verse 6 of John 15, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away. Listen to this. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away. Like a branch and withers. So the first thing that happens is you get cut off from genuine life if you do not abide in Jesus. If you don't actually follow the commands of Jesus, you get cut off from the life of the religion of Jesus. And it says that the branches that are already cut off and now withered are gathered and then they're thrown into a fire. Excuse me, the fire. This is the fire of fires and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You see, Jesus bringing that same message of John home. You prove that you're a disciple of Jesus that you bear fruit. But if you bear thorns, it's only good to be burned. Another preaching of Jesus. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So this isn't just feels. This is to abide in Jesus' love is to actually do what he says. And it says, These things I have spoken to you, that your joy may be, my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. What's the real reason that we obey Jesus Christ? I believe it's because there was no command of the Father that Jesus refused for our sake. At least in part, Jesus of course did it to inherit a kingdom and to glorify his Father, but he also did it for his people. He did what he did to redeem them, to save them. He laid down his life for his friends. So there can't be a commandment of Jesus Christ that we are not willing to obey. The thing I think is most important in this season of the church is to get away from the accoutrements of what it is to be church. Get away from the Sunday morning gathering. Yes, stop attending 
a local church. Get alone with God. Really renew that relationship with Him. Really get a lane with the Holy Spirit. Learn to understand what He speaks from heaven, as Hebrews says. And that way, when things get crazy, as I am sure that they probably will, you will know exactly what God expects from you, not simply in the moral commands generally, but in the specific moment-to-moment -moment decisions. You will have a helper in time of need. You will have some voice of wisdom speaking into that issue because you will have spent it not getting with people, but getting with God. Today is the day of salvation. So choose this day whom you will serve. If you're to serve Jesus Christ, then really serve him. But if you're going to serve the Christian religion, you will get whatever Christian religion can do for you. And maybe a Christian religion without Jesus Christ.